record on this computer. Shalom and whether well, welcome to another lecture on hi Ina. Welcome to a lecture on the oh, sorry, um, sorry for being late. Biblical the meeting, prophets. Okay, we are discussing uh the second book of Samuel, and we just came over, we just finished a uh well, we're going to see the extent of it, but the dramatic and troubling and sad story of King David's sin. King David sins with Bathsheba. King David sins with Uriah. Nathan, the prophet, comes to him and yells at him and tells him a parable. And in the parable, he says it's a terrible person. And King David says, yes, it's a terrible person. And then Nathan said, that's you. So um, that was frightening. And David understands it. And he made a mistake and he says, Hakati la Hashem, I've forgiven, I, I, I am a, a sin before God. And God responds to the prophet that you will not lose your kingship, your being the king, you will not lose it. But terrible things are going to happen to you. You're going to see a lot of death and destruction because you caused it basically. Um, you have to get punished for what you've done wrong. So that's, uh, there seems to be a, uh, one, the first event is the, the child of the union of David and Bathsheba dies. So that you'd say, okay, that's terrible. Um, but that's not enough. And actually there are gonna be four of David's kids, children that are going to die. And um, because David said that the, the, the rich person has to pay the poor person four times. So that's as if David is saying, yeah, I know my punishment. I have to pay four times what I did wrong. Chapter 13. Absalom has a sister named Tamar. Absalom's brother, stepbrother, and Tamar's stepbrother, um, falls in love with her and he can't, you know, he's love sick. Okay. But he's, you know, they have the same father. So that's not a good thing. I've known has a brother named Yonadav and you know, I, I'm sorry, I have a friend Yonadav and Yonadav says, Oh, why don't you get her to make something for you to eat? And, um, once she's ready in your room, then you'll know what to do. So uh, he got sick, fake, fake getting sick in verse six. And he tells his father, please tell Tamar, she always knows what to make me to eat. And this is exactly what happens. And she goes there and she makes all these Libby votes. We discussed a little bit of this already. And um, he gets, gets everyone in the room in verse 10. Um, he eats. In verse 11, he says, sleep with me, my sister, which is frightening, right? <laughs> And in verse 12, she says, please, uh, that's a terrible thing to happen in, you know, with a family, religiously and, and, and politically, no. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to be like one of the Nevalim, one of the most vile, embarrassing things in Israel. 14, though, he didn't listen and he raped her. He raped her and he slept with her. But then in verse 15, he hated her and he wanted to get rid of her. He didn't want her any longer, which is really, really difficult for her. So she, um, she went out and she was just a, a wreck and she put um, ashes on her head and she tore her garments and she went screaming in the halls and then she really went out of her mind. Uh, Absalom says, uh, did, did Amnon do this to you? Um, so Ashlam was on, right? This is Ashlam's own brother, own sister. And uh, we already know what's going to happen. Um, he, he holds off a few years, in fact. But then after two years in verse 23, Absalom was having his uh, animals sheared. He invited all the king's sons. All the king's sons came. It was a big party. It was a big event. And there... Um, he has someone kill Amnon. Now, and the rumor came out that all of the king's sons were killed by Absalom. Um, and uh, David was obviously, in verse 31, he tore all his garments. He says, all my kids are dead. 
And Yonadav, the friend in verse 32 says, no, 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 it was just Amnon that died. I don't know if that's like a comforting way to say it, but don't think that all your children died. It was just Amnon that died. And obviously David, David knew that Absalom, his son, murdered, let's call it an honor killing, right? Killed his other son. Because he, you know, because he raped her, and and that's uh, that's the end of that story. What happens is verse thirty four. Absalom runs away. Why does Absalom run away? Because listen, you go and you kill a prince. Uh, you're in trouble, yeah, even if it's justified. But you still you're doing it without David's consent, and you killed the the prince of the of the king of the of Israel. Okay, so so Absalom runs away. So um, now the watchman on duty sees a large crowd of people coming. And Yonadav says to the king, you see, you see, here are all your sons. Obviously minus Amnon, right? Um, but David just breaks out and starts crying. Now Absalom had run away to the king of Geshur, protecting himself from his father's retribution, by the way, it sounds like Absalom, although you might say that he did something wrong, you might say that he did something right in defending the honor of his sister, but he's running away from his father, like David ran away from Saul. And he stayed there for three years. So you can imagine that David loses, you know, his daughter, she's, she's going to die. And his son who killed, who raped her, he's, he, he's dead. And his son, who killed him, he he loses him as well for three years. Um, and David was extremely distraught. David was kind of losing his mind, even though he knew rationally that this is part of my punishment. And he sees the unraveling of his house regarding his children and sexual immoral activities. I mean, how can you not see the writing on the wall? Um, and his own son runs away because of the, the sins that took place in the house. Um, King David was at least wanted his son Absalom to come back. I mean, he's gotten over it several years. He's gotten over the murder of his son uh, unknown, but he didn't want to live without his son Absalom. So but he couldn't do anything. In other words, he was he, he was a little bit stuck in this position not running to get Absalom back after he figured Absalom was okay. Uh, uh, you know, when the father and his son get into a, a battle and it lasts and they don't talk to each other. And then, and then uh, you know, David is not going to make the first step. And Absalom is, is not is thinking that he doesn't want me ever to come back. And this is a standstill and the kingdom is suffering for it. And that leads us to chapter 14. In chapter 14, who tries to save the day, which means to make peace. Yoav, the son of Tsuya. Do you remember Yoav? Yoav is the general of King David. And he was very successful and conquered Jerusalem for him. He was at all the battles, but he was always his own man. Remember, he's the one who killed Avner ben Ner against David's wishes. So Yoav is a complicated personality. It's something probably to talk about. Um, but he's trying to do the right thing for the kingdom and for uh, and for David too. What does he do? This is the famous story of the woman from Tekoa. In the Tanakh, there, there, are always, there are several stories of wise women. And this is one of them, a wise woman from Tekoa. So he says, jo Joab sent to Tekoa and brought a wise woman from there. And he said to her, here's what I want you to do. Pretend you're in mourning, put on mourning clothes and don't put oil and act like a woman who's grieving for a long time for a departed one, okay? So she's gonna put on this act. 
She's going to go to King David and say the, the, you know, the following. And he told her what to say. And the woman of Tekoa came to the king, flung her face down and cried out, oh, help me, O oh, king. And he says, what troubles you? Oh, I'm a widow. My husband is dead. Your maidservants have two sons. You know, I have two sons. Excuse me a second. I have two sons. And they're fighting with each other. And one of them killed the other one, right? Now, David is listening to this woman tell a story about her two sons are fighting to each other and one of them killed the other. Now the whole clan confronted me and said, hand over the other one who killed the brother so that we can put him to death. And I don't want to put him to death after all, it's my other son um, that I'm gonna be without any, any children. That was her story, okay? Now the king in verse eight says to the woman, go home and I will issue you an order on your, in your behalf. In other words, I'll tell you what to do. The woman said to the king, my lord king, may the guilt be on me, on my ancestral house, your majesty is thrown her guiltless. So um, she's basically thanking the king for helping her take care of this. And he keeps saying to her, well, if anyone tells her anything, you know, you, if anyone causes you any pain, you bring him to me. And then she said the following, let your majesty be mindful of the Lord, your God, and restrain the blood avenger bent on destruction so that my son may not be killed. As the law, and he said, the law, as the Lord lives, not a hair of your son shall fall to the ground. So the point of this story is that Yoav wanted this woman to tell David a story. And in the story, David is supposed to deduce that what she, her story is his story. And that just as he's going to protect her from not having killed, from her other one son not being, the, the remaining son not being killed, then she needs to um, remind him that this is the same thing going on in his life. In the end of verse 11, David just says, okay, I will make sure that you will, your son will not be harmed. Then in verse 12, she lingers. She lingers. I guess she realized that she didn't really completely get her message across. So what does she say? Please let me say another word to you, my king. Sure. sure. She said, why then have you planned the like against God's people. In making this pronouncement, your majesty condemns himself in that your majesty does not bring back his own banishment. Ah, so she tried to do it by way of a parable, a story, and he wasn't listening to it. So she finally says it outright. She said, well, if you are so willing to defend my son, why aren't you willing to defend your own son? Well, right? So he said, she said, we're all going to die. Um, so why should we, you know, wait and, and be in this trouble all, the, you know, the entire time? In other words, before we all die, let's try to make amends. The reason I came to the Lord, my king, to say this is that the people frighten me. I thought I would speak to you, your, you, your majesty, and maybe you listen to me. For your majesty would surely agree to deliver his handmaid from the hands of anyone who would seek to cut me off and my son. Let the word of the king provide comfort for my lord. The king is like an angel of God, understanding everything good and bad. May the lord, your God, be with you. Now, so she went ahead and she gave a little more information. In other words, she realized that the first story didn't work. So she kind of directly spoke to the king. And uh, now the king is trying to get, David's already getting suspicious. Like all of a sudden she's giving me Musa. She's telling me how I should treat. So he says to her uh, in verse 18, 
Okay, now time. Tell me, did jo did Yoa put you up to this? And she says, "How did you know of such a thing? You know what? You know, you know what? Uh, what wisdom you have? You have the wisdom of of an angel, my lord." Okay, that's the story. So now David understands. It's a bit of a convoluted story, but David finally understands that Yoav is trying to help him out. And Yoav is trying to say, bury the hatchet, which means it's time to um, you know, make up with your son. So David does this. Let's look at verse 21. The king said to Yoav, go and bring back my son. Absalom. And he, he throws his face on the ground. He seems to thank, so thankful. And Yoav blesses the king. And I know that you're, you're, you, you've granted my request. And, and it sounds like David gave in to um, Yoav, listening to this woman, to bring the son back. He's not going to harm the son, but it sounds like they're going to have a big reunion. But look what happens. Um, verse 23, he brings us shalom to you, Shalayim, where David is. But the king said, let him go directly to his house, his house and not present himself to me. In other words, even after this rapprochement, right, that they finally are supposed to make up, the king doesn't allow himself. He, it's too, it's too painful for him to see Absalom. When he looks at, when he figures if he looks at Absalom, he's going to remember all the terrible things that took place and that Absalom, what Absalom did. And therefore he says, yes, I'll make peace, but I'm not going to see Absalom. Now, that doesn't, you know, Absalom went directly to his house and didn't present himself to the king, verse 24. Now the, the Navi tells us parenthetically, verse 25, Absalom was admired by all of Israel for his beauty. By the way, who else was admired for his beauty? King David. So he had, uh, you know, from the sole of his foot to the crown on his head, he was without blemish. And when he cut his hair, it was wavy and it was 200 shekel worth of royal wear. He was like this goddess kind of uh, um, prince. And by the way, he had three sons and a daughter whose name was Tamar. He named his daughter after his sister who died, that she took her own life or she, whatever the case is. He lives in Yushalayim for two years without speaking to the king. Now we have to wonder, you know, how is this going to play out? Well, let me tell you how it plays out, okay? Absalom sends a message to Yoav and he's getting upset already. He says, he says to the king, he says to Yoav, the king never even let me come see him. But Yoav doesn't even answer him. So he says, okay, look, Avshalom has a field. Go set it on fire. When, Av, when Yoav, I'm sorry, Yoav has a field, go set it on fire. So Avshalom has someone set the field on fire and Yoav runs over to him. He said, what have you done? You crazy? And he said, oh, you remember me? I am sitting here for two years and I haven't seen my father's face. He says, why did I leave Kshur? Why, why did I come from outside of Israel if I'm no better off, if I were still there? Let me appear before the king. And if he finds me guilty, I will be put to death. Well, Yoav goes to the king and reported this to him. And the king finally summoned Ashalom and they came to the king and he fit, flung his face down before the king and the king kissed Absalom. Now this seems like that they finally, after several years, five years has got, have gone by and he hasn't kissed him once, he, ha he hasn't talked to him. Now we, we wonder, what's their relationship like? Remember the Navi threw in this idea that Absalom was quite beautiful and had a very family and, her, and Absalom, what was he doing during this time? 
So in chapter 15, we find out. Absalom provided himself with a chariot, horses, and 50 men running in front of him. He would rise early and stand by the road of the gate, city gates. And whenever a man had a case to go before the king, he would say, what town are you from? And he said, yeah, I'm from such and such a tribe in Israel. And Absalom would say to him, it is clear that your claim is right and just, but there's no one but for the king. The king's not going to listen to it. If only I were appointed judge in the land and everyone with a legal dispute who came before me, I would see that he got his rights. Absalom would go and kiss people. Absalom would, what, are we, what, is, what are we saying, basically? Absalom is pining for the kingdom. David's own son is trying to get rid of him. A coup. After Absalom, in, uh, in verse 7, after Absalom is 40 years old, he says to the king, let me go to Hebron and fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. It doesn't tell us exactly what that vow is. Um, I'm sorry, the next verse says, because I made a vow that saying that if, if I ever get back to Jerusalem, I will go and worship God. Why does he go to Hebron? Why is Absalom going to Hebron? The ark already was in Yerushalayim. Why was Absalom going to Hebron? The answer is, remember who, who started in Hebron? Now, David, we don't know, you know, does he not know what's going on with Absalom? Look what happens in verse 10. David says in verse 9, go in peace, go to Hebron. He wasn't thinking twice about it, but Absalom sent agents spies to all the tribes of Israel and says, when you hear the blast of the horn, announce that Absalom had become king in Hebron. He appoints himself king in Hebron, like his father did to Shaul. 200 men of Jerusalem accompanied Absalom. Absalom also sent Ahitophel from Gilo who used to give counsel to David. And they joined together and they had a conspiracy and a coup against David and he started increasing in numbers. Now in verse 13, someone came and told David, the loyalty of the men of Israel have veered toward Absalom. And here is the climax of the whole story. Your son, with whom you made up, but you still haven't had a strong relationship. Uh, but over the past years has been getting stronger and developing more political um, capital. And all of a sudden he's appointed king in Israel, in Hebron, okay? Now what's Absalom's next step? David knows his next step is he's gonna storm the castle. David's own son is going to storm the castle. Now, what's he going to do? Is David's son going to kill him? The answer is David thought that that's what's going to happen. Therefore, look upon, look for verse 14. David said to all his ministers with him, who were still left with him, let's flee at once or we will not escape from Absalom. We must get away quick, quickly or he'll overtake us and bring down disaster and put the city to the sword. So the people who are closest to King David says, whatever you say, we'll go with you. And verse 16, the king is driven out of his palace with his household, except he left 10 concubines to mine the palace. So the king leaves, and this is, you know, what a terrible story. David is driven out by his son and he leaves the palace and he goes east. All his fathers marched past him. All the Gittites, the Kratites, and the Platites, 600 men were all leaving the palace. Uh, David wasn't fighting here because how do you fight against your own son? The king said, so people from Gat, who were not Jews, but were close with the kings. One, one's name was Itai from Gat. 
And he said to, to Itai, listen to me, he said, you know, he's, he's a supporter of King David. So he said, Itai, stay in Jerusalem. I need friends on the inside. Go back and stay with the new king. And um, remain faithful to me. And then maybe one day you'll tell me when I can come back. Okay. 21, Itai replies to the king. As the Lord lives and my king lives, I will do it, whether in death or in life, I shall do so. Okay? And David says to Itai, march on. And he goes back with his children. He goes back to Jerusalem. And imagine this scene, verse 23, David is walking from the palace in Jerusalem down into the Kidron Valley, up towards the Mount of Olives. And everyone is weeping and everyone is crying because... Um, David is leaving the, the, the kingdom. Now, they cross the Kidron Valley and Sadok, the priest, and all the Levites are carrying the ark. After all, if David is leaving, so the ark is leaving. But the king says to Sadok, take the ark back to the city. This is not something, you know, if, I, if I'm being punished by God, I'm not going to go take the ark with me. If God uh, wants me back, he will bring me back and let him let me see his, his ark or his place. Okay. And if he should say, I do not want you, then, then he has to do what he pleases. So David is acting very nobly and very uh, properly and he, to telling them to, uh, to go back and, um, um, bring bring the ark back. And he said to the to Tzadok, you understand? Return to the safety of the city with your two sons, Achimaz and Eviatar. And I will linger around in the wilderness, going over the dead, the uh, the Mount of Olives, down into the wilderness, which is, you know, um, towards the Dead Sea. So Tzadok and Aviatar bring the ark back and they stay in Jerusalem. David goes up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head is covered and he walks barefoot. This is the king of Israel. And all the people that were walking with him covered in their heads and they wept. And David was told that Achitophel, right, his own advisor, joined forces with Absalom. And he turned to God and he said to God, please frustrate Achitophel's counsel, which we'll see later, another story of that. When he reached the top, people would normally bow down to God. Hushai, another man from Arki, was there to meet him with his torn robe and earth on his head. And David didn't want all these people who were so connected and so close with him to, to, to suffer. So he said to Hushai, um, you'll be a burden to me. You might as well just go back to the city. And stay and stay with Absalom, and um, and then maybe Hushai. What you'll do is right. David's already planning. He's strategizing. You'll also be a bit of a plant for me. So say I I serve you Absalom, and but then hopefully we can you can help me um, get back to where things belong. Um, and so Hushai, the friend of David, reaches the city of Absalom as Absalom was entering the city of Jerusalem. This then is the drama, and you'll see it continues, obviously, for the next chapters. David is kicked out of his own palace, but while he's doing it, he's making plans to try to find a way back. Of course, he doesn't want to find the way back, which is going to cause a civil war, going to cause destruction in his own house. So that's the end of chapter 15, and that's our class for tonight. Stay tuned until next week where we find out what happens with David. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye. Yeah. Lila Tov. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Good. Bye. Lila Tov, thank you. Bye. -bye.